Hey guys, David here. I know it's been a while since my last update, but in the meantime I've had a lot of comments and questions on the videos about learning more about the calculations behind the ride. So in this video I'm going to go over some basics of it. I'm not going to go too in detail with what I've been using or what they really use in the industry, uh, but maybe this will get you started and uh, get you asking a little bit of questions and maybe doing some of your own research. But hopefully it kind of gives you a window into what it takes to design the roller coaster dynamically. Keep in mind in this video we won't go over the banking or the lateral forces, just the vertical forces. Welcome to the Roller Coaster Project. Okay, albeit kind of tacky, uh, I found this to be the best way for us to go over how the roller coaster calculations work. And the first thing to look for I know this is very UPS commercial, but screw it, it'll work. The first thing we have to go over, we have to understand the principle of conservation of energy. It's understood that energy in is equal to energy out. A law of conservation of energy is energy is neither created nor destroyed. And we take this mainly from a dynamics book. Um, this is, you know, any kind of dynamics or kinematics book or basically just physics 101. And that's really all the roller coaster is. But if we expand energy going in and energy out, we end up with potential energy plus kinetic energy, all initial. As I clearly mess up, Then potential energy number two, and kinetic energy number two, or final kinetic energy and final potential. But there's something missing. We call this negative work from point one to two. Or, for cases like a roller coaster, we're going to call this friction. So let's rewrite the equation, adding in the appropriate variable. We have our initial potential and kinetic energies minus our work because we always lose some energy due to friction, due to drag, due to some other outside factor and that energy is actually lost and expelled as heat. So we decided, okay, for our work, we have a friction value that we lose every inch or foot. In our case, we're using inch, but for a ride, it would be, of course, in feet. And every foot that we move forward, we lose so much energy. This is our equation. Now, to determine the friction value, I found the friction per bearing, and then I applied that per the weight of the car. And then I multiply that by the number of the cars that I have. So say we're going 24 feet and our total distance for this entire first drop to take place will be 70 feet. Keep in mind, purely example. We're trying to find our final velocity at point number two. That would be kinetic energy number two. And our initial velocity, we're saying we start at rest or zero. So now we decided to expand potential energy, so that's mass times gravity times our initial height plus one half the mass times our initial velocity squared minus our friction times di distance is equal to our second potential energy or mass times gravity times final height plus one-half mass times velocity final squared. We can simplify these because we're just assuming that at the beginning our initial kinetic is zero and at the end we are at a zero height so our potential is zero. This makes things simple. One thing that you don't see here is how I came up with the friction value, the F, which would be 0.3 I did this as a almost a massless value. So because of that, I can get rid of mass on either side, 
because mass was already taken out of our friction value. Then we simplify the equation down even further. There's our friction value assumption. Not to be confused with a coefficient of friction, this is our value per foot, or how much work or negative work is going to happen in this system. We end up with 38.78 feet per second, which is roughly 26.44 miles per hour. So for the bottom of a hill, we want to feel a positive G, a positive increase to what we think, what we feel gravity as. At rest, we are at 1 G, or 1 times the force of gravity. We want to create a radius. We're going to make this very simple, and we're going to use circles. And that's the best way to do it. You can do a bunch of tangents and circles. They actually did that in the 70s. And you can make a great roller coaster like that, if you understand how to calculate the velocities and the radii involved to make sure that you can use g-forces to your advantage. So we want to know the r that's going to be based on our velocity from the last equation and we want it to give us 3 and 3 quarter g. Newton's second law dictates that the sum of the forces is equal to your mass times acceleration. In this case, we're using a, sim a simple circle, which would be our centripetal force, which is mass times velocity squared over r. Just a note that gravity is in is 32.2 feet per second squared. So we draw what's called a free body diagram, or it's a point on which the forces act. And since we said up is positive, we have a normal force, or what we feel as our weight being pushed back against our feet. And then we have the direction of our acceleration, our mass times gravity, that was our weight. And then we also have centripetal force. Centripetal force always works its way towards the center point. So, solving this equation for R, since we had our velocity from the last equation. Our radius design value is 16.983. Knowing how to calculate the velocities and forces at each point along the ride can help us design it. And then we'll use a modeling program such as AutoCAD or any CAD program to draw it out. Um, feel free to comment below. Uh, thanks for following along and we're going to continue to upload new things in the future uh, since we're just getting settled in up here. Uh, working on a new enclosure for the CNC mill and we have a lot of things coming up. Thank you for following along. Subscribe below and we'll talk to you soon.